So it's been a rough couple months for North African democracy. Surprising few, Tunisia's president, Kais Saeed, has extended his suspension of that country's parliament, something that was supposed to just last for 30 days. Libya supposedly has an election coming up in December, but planning for it keeps falling further and further behind. So maybe we should take a look at some other countries for hope. Well, it turns out that Algeria had an election back in June, and Morocco had one just this last week. So are these countries democracies? Well, not really. We should all be suspicious of U.S. government-funded and defense contractor-run organizations like Freedom House, but my reading of the region's history leads me to believe that that organization's rankings of Morocco and Algeria are mostly fair. Morocco probably gets a nicer rating from Freedom House because Morocco buys so many U.S. weapons, but neither country is truly free or representative. That doesn't mean that they aren't on their way there, though. If the past five years of U.S. history have taught us anything, it's that democracy is not an either-or or an on-off proposition. It's more of a spectrum. Call it the uh, Korea spectrum. At one end, you've got the out-there totalitarianism of North Korea, and at the other end, you have the world-leading, fully consolidated, representative democracy of South Korea. Every country in the world, from Africa to Europe to the Americas, sits somewhere on this spectrum and can move back and forth. Every country's public has to remain vigilant to keep their countries moving in the right direction. At points over the past 10 years, Tunisia looked like it was closing in on South Korea territory. But with President Saeed's suspension of the parliament back in July, it now looks like Tunisia has fallen back to the level of what Algeria and Morocco have. Systems with functional elections, but a too powerful individual or group that really calls all the shots. I still have hopes that Tunisia can bounce back fairly quickly, but the power figures in Morocco and Algeria are much more entrenched. Morocco is led by a dynasty that goes back to the 1600s. Perhaps because it has so much more real history and weight than most of the Gulf monarchies, the Moroccan monarchy is also comfortable with a more real-looking parliament than most Gulf countries can handle. But these institutions are only real up to a point. Last week's election in Morocco provides a good example. Morocco does have real political parties with real differences, and even in some cases discernible ideologies. They do run elections, they do form governments, but the power of that government is limited by the whims of the king, both constitutionally and even more powerfully by tradition and practice. So yeah, last week's election provided some really interesting headlines that can be used to serve any number of agendas. But it's important to recognize the limitations of what these words mean in the context of the Moroccan system. Yeah, the liberals won, but the new liberal prime minister, Aziz Akanouche, is basically a dynastic oligarch and the head of a company that has flourished under monarchy for generations now. I have my own agenda that I'd like to see served here. Perhaps with the Islamists out, the king will have fewer excuses to keep real power away from the elected government. To date, it's been the monarchy that has called the shots in Morocco. Last week, the king's liberals defeated the king's Islamists. This is a smaller change than the headlines might lead you to believe. The situation in Algeria couldn't be more different from Morocco in some ways, but in others it's strikingly similar. Le pouvoir, or the power, the military business oligarchy that runs Algeria, doesn't go back to the 1600s, but it's just as firmly rooted as any monarchy. Revolutionary ideology mixed with corruption has made for many sad stories over the past half century. Algeria has fairly regular elections, but most Algerians simply aren't interested. The persistence of le pouvoir, even after a protest movement kicked out Algeria's 20-year president back in 2019, combined with the way that 
public services are declining along with the oil price means that the Algerian public tends to stay home when they're supposed to be voting. The Algerian election in June was expected to have an exciting narrative in the opposite direction from Morocco, with Islamists doing surprisingly well. In the event, the Islamists neither won big nor lost big. Instead, the main story, again, became the embarrassing lack of public participation. The election delivered none of the legitimacy that the establishment was looking for. It's common in the United States to have low expectations of Muslim or African governments, but that's not the way I see it. In fact, as somebody who's spent a fair amount of time studying US and British political history, I'm pretty optimistic about Morocco and Algeria. The countries already have so many of the elements in place, and it's possible to imagine a peaceful evolution into better systems. I believe this because that's exactly what happened in both the United States and Britain. The US Constitution goes back 230 years, and the roots of the British Parliament go back at least 800 years. But neither the British nor American systems were more democratic than today's Algeria and Morocco before the mid-20th century. I mean, maybe you could argue that the Anglo systems became as free as Morocco and Algeria in the 19th century with the abolition of slavery, but I think you'd probably be wrong. Women couldn't vote in either of these countries until the 20th century, and until very recently, arguably still today, both countries were run by a very corrupt and nearly impenetrable elite of white male Protestants. But what both the US and UK had long before their 20th century improvements were systems that had the potential to improve. They didn't need some cataclysmic revolution to get more representative, more equal, and more wealthy. The governments had what they needed to evolve in a positive direction. And that's exactly what I see in Morocco and Algeria today systems that have the potential to evolve very positively and peacefully. Uh, both countries have already made serious efforts in that direction. Arguably, they've been failures, but they show the potential. Uh, Morocco made a serious attempt towards more constitutional government in 2011 in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. Um, back in the 1980s, Algeria had a serious effort towards democratization that ended really, really disastrously, but uh, you could argue that they're already in a new process with a lot of positive potential that started in 2019. Now, that view is almost certainly terribly naive. Having that kind of optimism is a pretty clear indication that I was raised in an English-speaking country. There are other democratic traditions that are just as valid and might indicate a completely different result. I'm on shaky ground here, but my sense is that Islamic tradition is more preoccupied with the idea of justice. For many Muslims, it might seem necessary to wipe away the old corrupt system and start anew instead of engaging in incremental improvement. I feel like I'm on firmer ground when I talk about the French tradition, which also remains powerful in North Africa, as I covered in my Tunisia video a month or so back. It's very easy, coming from the Anglo tradition of centuries of unbroken wealth and hegemony, to throw a hissy fit when the forms of representative democracy are trampled upon. Even before the imperialist invasion, Tunisia was closely associated with France. France is, in its own way, a strong democracy, but it's not exactly renowned for institutional stability. The current French government is the Fifth Republic, and it only dates back to 1958. Some of the French republics have lasted as long as seven decades, but the second one only lasted four years. I think it's fair to say that after seven years, Tunisian democracy's second republic has failed. But that doesn't mean we should lose hope. It's entirely possible that North Africa just isn't interested in the sort of slow, boring change that seems to have worked in some English-speaking countries. Maybe they're more interested in something a little quicker, a little more dramatic, and a little more French. But shouldn't that be a cause for optimism as well? Maybe North Africa is even closer to better systems than I think they are. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe 
and I would like to thank Shervan of Caspian Report for inspiring this video. It was an honor to research Morocco and Algeria with Shervan and help out a little with his new video. If you don't already know Caspian Report, you are in for a treat. Check out and subscribe to his channel at the link here. Thanks.